John chapter 4, verses 31 through 38. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Pray with me. Father, we ask that your spirit would continue to take us deep. We pray that you would, by your power alone, be active to find hearts in this room, to speak a specific word of hope, of encouragement, of truth. We pray it would be the perfect mixture from Jesus of love and truth. We ask, Father, you pour into me the gift of preaching, that you pour into your church a deep hunger and openness to hear from you. Find in us a fertile field, Father, to sow and reap from. And may we rejoice in your work, in your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning... uh, there's someone very special to me that's in this room. Ali Spazelli has uh, returned from, uh, I guess, teaching up in McKinney. And how long do you do this, Ali? Through the semester? It's, <clears throat> it's one of these wonderful things of, about uh, getting to stand where I am and to see the congregation every week. God assembles the body. And some weeks... There are people that can't be here, and some weeks there are uh, it's just a different group. And it's specifically the group that God has a word for today that he brings. Chavo's here. And we've, got, we've got people we don't see often that are here today, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for these many reunions we get to have, but also excited because there is a day coming when we will be reunited forever. We get to be living in eternity as brothers and sisters. We get to have a relationship based no longer on just faith, but on sight, where we get to see our Father, we get to see each other, and know that forever we get to be brothers and sisters, kindred spirits in the kingdom of God. So as a preacher, I get to give you a little bit of my perspective on that. I'm glad all of you are here today. I'm glad the Lord has assembled this body, because I believe he has a word for us. Now Jesus said, After he was speaking in John chapter 4 to a Samaritan woman, uh, he had uh, moved in her in such a way that she was excited to run back to her village and share that she had just met the Lord, a Samaritan proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. This was rare. She ran after her town to do this, and while she was there, his disciples showed up and said, Rabbi, we've been traveling this whole time. You haven't eaten eaten anything, and... Jesus said, I have food you know nothing about. I like to imagine Peter leans over and says, did he bring a granola bar we didn't see, you know? I have food you know nothing about, and Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And then Jesus declared something very interesting. He told the seasons and he told the times. He said, we live in the season of harvest. Today is the season of harvest, says Jesus. I think it's interesting that rarely are we good at recognizing a good time until we've had it, until it's done. We don't enjoy a blessing until we don't have any longer. 
or we spend a lot of energy recalling former days, nostalgic days, that we remember with a certain angle as being pure and righteous and good and fruitful. And Jesus says, if you want to be able to tell the times, if you want to be able to live correctly, you need to know when you live today. No longer, says Jesus, should you consider the days of Moses where we lived under the law. No longer should you live, consider the days of King David when we lived under a monarch. No longer should you consider the days of the prophets when they called out in the wilderness. He said, today it's a different era beginning now. Today you don't live back then. You don't live in the future. You live in harvest season. That's the telltale mark, hallmark of the days of redemption of Jesus Christ. That there's more to harvest than, than we understand. There's more fish to catch than there are fishermen out there in the waters. You can hear the grief in his voice when he says, Open your eyes. Can you not see how fruitful the fields are? Almost this urgency to say, If you don't get after it, there's going to be tons of crops rotting in the field. This morning, we're entering the tail end of our sermon series about harvest. We talked about the importance of recognizing that God's designed you to be a gatherer, someone who goes and takes a blessing and enjoys it, shares it with others. We talked about the importance of understanding a field and how to sow into it appropriately, how to use words and actions. Last week, we did the hard one, which is the importance of waiting. If you're a farmer and you don't know how to wait, you're going to be hungry. Patience is an important aspect. But for every plant you sow, for every season of waiting, Jesus says, even though there are fields you have to wait for the harvest, to this day there are other fields that are ready to reap today. While you're actively sowing, you're actively waiting, that doesn't mean that you're not harvesting. There are fields, there are moments, there are opportunities in your life all day. Jesus said over and over and over again, the harvest is plentiful, but there are few people who know how to actually go and recognize a harvest and gather it in. And so this morning, we enter the final phase of the harvesting where you plant, you wait, and then you gather. And there are three crops I wanted to mention. In fact, there's so much I want to mention, it's actually going to lop over to next week. I'm only going to get into two today because I really love you and care for you. But if you're harvesting, it's good to know what you're looking for. And the first two crops I wanted to point out that, that are active, they're alive, they're ready right now to go and reap, to gather together, to bring and move and, and, and collect into a large storehouse. The, there's two crops I wanted to mention. And the first one, it's a crop that, that it's hard to give the words to, but I, as a preacher, I like to use the word, it's the crop of testimony. It's the crop of recognizing that God, right now, in our streets, is doing marvelous things. He's giving people dreams at night. Jerry shared one with me this morning. He's giving insights to our kids. He's opening up eyes. He's changing hearts. He's delivering people from illnesses. He's moving in people to change vocations. He's actively working all the time in our community. Do you believe this? We serve a living Lord. A crop of testimony means that the church of Jesus Christ ought to be the people who have open eyes to recognize the Lord's work and then gather it in and talk about it. To break through that barrier, I think it's interesting that the last place we'll talk about a powerful spiritual experience is at church. Because we think everyone's going to think we're weird or one of those kind of Christians. It's interesting to me that the household of God is the last place we feel comfortable bringing in the sheaves, gathering in the crop, talking openly that God did this. God spoke this word. I was reading Jesus calling and then God said a specific word that has everything to do with what I'm going through in real time. And I don't even understand how he did that. But I know that he did. 
The first crop is the crop of testimony of God's glorious work today, what he's doing right now. A lot of times when people say, you need to share your testimony with other people, what, that, that's kind of the old evangelical, evangelistic move where you share your salvation story. I'm not talking about sharing your salvation story. If that's what you got going on, that's great. Please shout it. But to share a testimony about what God's doing means today, something in the past week, God showed up in a major way in my life. Or he showed up in a major way in my neighbor's life. Or he gave someone a dream that matched up with someone else's dreams. I don't know if you know this, but there are more people in this congregation dreaming about First Christian Church than ever before. And you know the difference between just a normal dream and a dream of the Lord because you wake up moved by it. You can smell it. You can see it. You were touched by it. There are more people dreaming about First Christian Church. And what's interesting to me is that they're dreaming not just about the people and the facility at First Christian, but they're dreaming an awful lot about water, flowing streams. We've had some person dream that while we're in here worshiping, holes open up under the wood, and you can see just under the wood there's a huge river flowing. We had a dream come in this morning about rivers flowing out of First Christian that was muddy because it was churned up. And the only reason I'm up here to say anything about it and know that these dreams are occurring is because there's a spirit of testifying in this church that wasn't here a couple months ago. People feel comfortable gathering in the crop, not leaving it on, on your bed when you dreamt. Not leaving it in your devotional when you read. Not leaving it at church camp when you heard from the Lord as a youth. Not leaving it at this moment in your life, in your marriage. No longer do we leave these things out in the field. We gather them up into the storehouse of God. When I was a youth, we called them God sightings. Whenever you saw God, God's fingerprints. I don't mean someone was nice to you or you saw the cloud move. No, I mean a legitimate really hard to explain away moment where God is active. Crop number one is that the church of Jesus ought to be a storehouse where folks can bring in their testimony about what God did. And when we become a congregation, a people of harvest in that way, something changes. So that when you enter into fellowship at First Christian in your Sunday school class, Sunday morning in worship, Deborah group, wherever you engage, when you enter in, you're surrounded with people who consistently make you look at God. Not at protests, not at Trump, not at the world's problems. I heard a word from the Lord specifically to me, and you can take it or leave it. I heard it this Wednesday morning because I was in my prayer closet huffing and puffing to the Lord, telling him how to do his job. Uh, You may have done that before. And I was so outraged by this, that, and the other, and God told me, quit protesting. He said, look at me, live with me, testify about me, and as Jesus said, and then you will be a person who is protested against. If you live with the Lord in this world who doesn't know him, and you walk with the Lord, this world will try to spit you out. Jesus said it himself, if they've persecuted me, if they've protested me, they will protest and persecute me you and what he was saying to me was look at me don't look at the problems the more you protest and look at the problems of this world the uglier you get this world doesn't need any more ugly people this world doesn't need any more bitter people this world doesn't need any more restless people this world doesn't need any more frazzled people this world needs people who Micah 6 ate it who walk humbly with the Lord who know what my justice looks like because it's revealed to you in the moment for God's justice is foreign to this world if we're a fellowship who testifies about the work of God in real time and can share from our hearts in real time what God's doing, what you'll find is that we show up and anticipate 
hearing about the living Lord. We start looking at him more often. And what the scriptures teach in Hebrews 3, if you spend time focusing on God, lo and behold, your heart grows in your trust of God. Doubt is diminished. We celebrate doubt in the disciples' church like it's a badge of honor. But doubt, given unruly room to run, grows and grows and grows. And doubt looks an awful lot like, I don't trust God. Where you can get an entire study degree program where you can explain away every red letter of the Bible. Anytime someone says a promise about God or testifies, you can say, yeah, 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 yeah. But, if that's who you are, if that's what you honor, I'm telling you, don't do that any longer. You're not participating in the loving, trusting open-hearted nature that God is invested in my life and he's trying to lord over me and he's trying to bring his glory into my world crop number one is being a harvesting community who testifies about the glory of the Lord there's enough bad news out there you don't have to go looking for bad news you're being flooded with bad news the church ought to be people of the good news The good news of the gospel of Jesus is that God's alive and he's not neglected his people. He's moving, he's breathing, he's more creative than any one of us. He's more authorized and sovereign. He is working perfection in this lousy world. Let's testify about what he's doing. The church ought to be the news source of talking about the the, the reporting of what God's doing. Update, this just in. God opened a heart. God healed a marriage. God healed a body. God gave someone a dream. God mended fences between people who were once at each other. God gave someone hope. The church ought to be the harvesters, the the local community that gathers in the crop of the testimony of the living God. And when you're around your church, you ought to be looking at God more than you're looking at your world or yourself. And you ought to be growing in your trust of the Lord. Ah, a hallmark of heaven is being able to enter the Lord's rest. The hallmark of hell is to be restless, bitter, distrustful, cold. We are heaven people. We are people that God is actively trying to break out of slavery and into his rest. The more we look at him, the more we testify and encourage others to consider the fact that God's alive, the more we're living into our design as a harvesting people of the glory of God. That's crop number one. Testimony. Crop number two. This is one of the best. It's the crop of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked so much about agriculture. Then he mentioned there's this vine. In Luke 15, he said there's this vine. I'm the vine, you're the branches, I'll display myself on you. Later, St. Paul talked about this, this vine and this seed and this movement and this fruit, and he got real detailed and said it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. And then he reminds us the world can't produce those things. The Democrats cannot produce those things. The Republicans cannot produce those things. Jesus says, peace I give you, the world cannot give it, but I can. The good news of the crop of the Holy Spirit is that it's God's crop. It's His work. It's His sowing and it's His gathering up and lifting up and when you've encountered a moment you know it when you see it when you've encountered a moment of the fruit of the Holy Spirit you don't want to touch it and break it off you want to gather other people to walk through it the fruit of the Holy Spirit is found in a blessed community I've heard from many of you compared to past days until today we are walking with so much more unity and peace and the love that pours between people is growing we think that's from a slick preacher or educated eldership no this is the Lord when the Lord decides to sprout a crop of his presence in a people or in a facility or who knows maybe at your favorite restaurant 
wherever you find it, what the scriptures would say is go and buy that field and go dwell there. If you find a pearl in the middle of a rough field, if you find a valuable thing, you go buy that field. You go spend your time, your everything to hang out, to live in that field. And ask God, please birth more of this harvest out in the world. More of your rain, more of your goodness. You know, when you walk through a field of the Holy Spirit, instead of plucking love and hoarding it for yourself, you holler out, hey Chris, hey Lynn, check out this field. Come walk in it with me. You don't gather the harvest, you gather the people. You call to your wife and say, honey, come out here, you've got to see the sunset. Or you post something on Facebook or something like that, but you call the people of God to come and walk through a field of plenty. A field of goodness. I believe God has declared First Christian Church a revived congregation of the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean holding snakes and drinking poison. It means the fruit. He has declared that he's going to create more than we've seen now. Even more harvest of his goodness. So that just by resting in your fellowship with your brothers and sisters, you get to soak up the rest and the peace of the Lord. Isn't that good news? That you're part of a blessed church? Life's too short to be part of a church that you don't love. And is not rolling with the Spirit. Isn't it great? That you feel like, oh, I might miss fellowship this week and actually feel like I might miss something. So I'm not going to miss, right, Chris? I'm going to get to church. I'm going to get here because I don't want to miss what the Lord might do. I don't want to miss that rebuke, oh no, or that love or that encouragement. I don't want to miss walking through this field of the glory of God. Two or three crops. Next week we're talking about the third. But the first is being a people who gathers together the testimony of the Lord. Be bold with reporting about God's goodness. And the other is being able to recognize where God's blessing and then just go lay in it. And say, hey, come lay with me. Come love this Lord with me. Come walk through this field with me. And there are two rules. We've talked about rules throughout the series. There's two rules that I want you to hold on to as we close here. The first rule, if you're going to be a good harvester, the first rule is that you have to keep your eyes open. There is way too much that God doesn't get credit for. There's way too much that he does provisionally for you that you don't see. When I took driver's ed as a kid, 15, I guess that's when you take it, I remember them saying, what's the most important body part you use to drive a car? They got some real colorful answers. And it was like, I don't know, your hands, your feet? He said, no, 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 your eyes. Your eyes. You can't drive without eyes. You can drive with one arm. You can drive with one foot. You have to have your eyes. You've got to be able to see. And the most important harvesting organ you have is your ability to see and smell and hear and locate the glory of the Lord around you. I'm telling you, if you're in Christ, He's birthing you with eyes that see and ears that hear so that you can inherit the kingdom of God today, the reign of God today. So rule number one is open your eyes. Open your senses to God. Rule number two, the last rule, is be mindful that as, as driven as God is for you to walk in His crop, there are other things out there trying to convince you there's no crop. Jesus talks about weeds And if you've ever gardened or you've ever farmed, the crop comes with diligence and hard work. The weeds come naturally. There are elements out there right now that will tell you, if you live today or back in the Dudley years, that will tell you, I know this is neat and all, and then they're real quick to offer bad interpretation to say, God's not blessing this. God's not here. Have you, have you ever met someone that's got a problem for every solution? Right? 
Someone that like really might end up in heaven like this. If you're a person of the harvest and you're opening your eyes, just be prepared that there will be scoffers. There will be parts of this world, parts of the church that will say, yeah, but. There will be grumblers. There will be people, people that discourage you from trusting in the Lord. There will be people that try to explain away every goodness of the Lord, every crop, every powerful move. They'll be right there to say, I've got a better answer. St. Paul gives a great warning against this. He says, do not be swayed by every trickery and scheming of deceitful men. Do not go into long discussions about genealogies and old wives' tales that are, in his words, fruitless. Walk in the fruit, says Scripture. Walk in the harvest. Don't hang out with people who are weeds in your life. Hang out with people that are encouraging you to trust God. Who are encouraging you to recognize a good time when you see it. Don't you wish that an alarm could go off and you, you, would, know that when you're, you would know when you're living in the good old days? You, you've heard a lot, I've, since I've been here, I've heard more about Dudley Strain than just about anything about the good old days. But I'm telling you, there were people in the good old days that didn't see it as the good old days. You know this. And there are people that are living today and what God's doing today and they don't see it as God. You'll miss it. St. Paul says, don't miss it. Do not be fooled. Revilers and drunkards and thieves, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. There are people in your midst that cannot inherit the kingdom today. They're not going to hell, but they just can't inherit it because they're too much infatuated with their distrust of a living God. They're unable to open their heart. And I'm telling you, the Lord and all the visions we have had, not only is He producing so much goodness in this world and recognized by this church, but He's also changing those of us, I used to be one, that had an explanation against everything the Lord did. He's churning the waters. He's turning the soil. Jesus is flipping the table so that if you are a person that your whole life has never, you know, I wish I could have a dream. I wish I could, if the Lord would show up, then I would believe even more deeply. If you're one of these people, hold on to your hats because people are experiencing the Lord in ways they haven't. As a harvesting people who gathers testimony and he walks in the field of the Holy Spirit, we've got to keep our eyes open to what God's doing and at the same time be mindful that just because someone has something to say negatively about the Lord doesn't mean they're right. And it also doesn't mean that tomorrow they won't be a harvester too. It's amazing. It's amazing when the scoffers when the Sauls, when the persecutors. It's amazing when the doubtful become the testifiers. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask that your spirit would move and continue to churn the soil. We pray, Lord, that we would have so much encouragement to trust you and to look for you. We pray, Father, that our eyes would be fixed to the glory of the Lord and that the world would melt away for a moment so that when we interact, not of this world but in this world, when we interact in the world, that we actually might be effective because we know the King of the universe, the Lord of all justice. Bless and keep us, forgive us our sins, and we pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would open our eyes to how glorious the harvest is. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.